All right, Jody. So um, this is a question I really have been interested in asking you. And, um, you know, how did this experience or your journey impact your marriage? Because it had to have changed certain aspects of it. Absolutely. I think when we first got my brain tumor diagnosis, we looked at probably as most any couple would, which is we are in this together. No matter what happens, we're in this for thick or thin. And my husband is very much a solid rock kind of person. He's an engineer. He, is, he, he likes is. to plan. <laughs> he likes to know what's coming next. He's routine. He, he wants to keep his schedule. Sure. That's just how his whole life yeah. is. And so he wanted things to remain that way as much as possible. Well, there's nothing like throwing a brain tumor into the mix to upset all of that. And I have to give him just huge credit and kudos and love because we have gone through so many difficult experiences in the last years and he has remained steady and firm and that solid rock in the ocean of storm. But that's not to say that it hasn't had some effect on our relationship and our marriage. And I would say one of the biggest things that happened very early on that I noticed at least because, because I, didn't always, I wasn't always aware. Of, for a little while, honestly, I was just not always aware of what everyone else was experiencing because I was trying to survive. Sure. You're in survival mode. When, and when you get in survival mode, they call it survival mode because everything else falls. You're super focused because that's what you have to do. To stay alive and I feel like everyone was in a little bit of survival mode so we all put certain things to the side and one of the things I think we all put to the side was facial paralysis because initially the doctors believed it was going to be temporary so regardless of how any of us may have felt initially I think we put that issue to the side and thought sure. this is temporary it's going away we don't actually have to address this right now the bigger thing was I got released from the hospital, still a very sick person, and I was not able to be the conquer the world girl I had been. And I was spending time in bed, resting, sleeping, medications, therapies, yep. appointments. And this wasn't for days or weeks after, this was for months and yeah. years. And that's a long time. Years after. And a lot of people don't realize, yes, I had my three craniotomies in the hospital, and then a month after I got out of the hospital, I had to go and have another surgery to implant um, a, a weight in my eye to okay. help close my eye a little bit because my eyeball was getting dried out and got I was it. having issues. And I have since had nine surgeries just for my eye to be able to protect my, my vision and my eyeball. And um, every single time we went into one of those, it was a scary experience knowing all of the potential side effects and things that could happen. So we immediately, upon getting out of the hospital, went from being equal level partners, we're in this together, to my husband became my caregiver. And my immediate thought was how grateful I was that he was taking such yeah. good, tender care of me and encouraging me to sleep, to stay in bed, to get the rest. He would be the one who would bring me my medications. Um, and when he was home, my mom lived with us for a period of months during that initial time. And my mom was also very much my caregiver. And she helped with some of the things like bathing me in sure. the mornings. I mean. And that's got, that's got to feel extremely vulnerable, right? It, I mean, you're a, a, an adult woman, mother. And with kids of my own. And you're being bathed. And I'm being bathed by my mom. And I guess the thing I thought about it was I was so grateful that she was willing to do that. Yeah. In that, because even though I still felt a little awkward at the situation, she never treated me that way and never looked at it that way. She was 100% in it to help me. And that was huge. And I remember one day getting out of the bathtub where we had you know, been able to bathe me and wash my hair. And it was maybe nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. That was the only thing I had done so far that day. And I was completely exactly. exhausted and wiped out and had to go back to bed and rest just from the process of getting bathed. So that type of thing with my mom and then with my husband, where it was not just 
go to bed and get some rest, Jody. It was physically yeah. demanding, helping every little step along the way. Um, and he was, he was truly, truly wonderful. Uh, what I didn't realize at the time is how difficult it is to be a caregiver, how difficult it is to go from that 50-50, we're both in this together, equal level, to all of a sudden... One has to carry more of the one weight. One has of... to carry more of the weight. And when I was in the hospital, he had to carry the physical, the emotional, the financial sure. weight of the whole thing. I was trying to survive. He was trying to keep the whole he rest of our Superman. lives <laughs> going. He had to be Superman. Yeah. And wherever he was, he felt like he should have been somewhere else. Yep. If he was at work, he felt like he should have been at the hospital. If he was at the hospital, he felt like he should have been home with the kids. If he was home with the kids, he felt like he should have been at work reporting in to make sure his job was steady and that we could keep on with the finances, with the insurance. And I didn't have a clue at the time of the weight that he was carrying because I was in that survival mode. You, so you shared with me before we started recording um, something that I'm very interested to hear. You had mentioned that he had shared some emotions with you, you know, down the road where you just kind of asked him and, um, and, and that surprised you. And I, I'm curious, what was one of those emotions? Maybe what was the most surprising thing that you were unaware of at the time that he felt but maybe never shared during that time? So to give a little context, when I wrote my memoir, The Sun Still Shines, I went through my experience with my brain tumor journey um, and it was first person. It was very much, you are in the seat with me, you're, you're my passenger, and we're going through this together. So people could see very much what I was going through, what thought process I was having. And I explained it from that perspective. Got it. And coming up on the fifth anniversary of when the book had been released, I had had, by that point in time, hundreds, if not thousands of questions from readers or people who'd heard me go and speak in public, um, do presentations, they'd say, oh my gosh, this is such an incredible story of survival. But what did it look like from your husband's perspective? Yeah. What was he feeling? What was he thinking or experiencing during this situation? And I realized, wow, that's a great question. Yep. And I thought I knew the answers. Got it. I thought I knew. So it came close to the time and I said, hey, Tolan, I got this great idea. I'm going to come up with this. We're going to do this Q&A. And based on what you say, I'm going to put your answers in the back of the book. It's going to be a bonus section for the fifth anniversary edition. And all right, are you ready? Okay, let's go. <laughs> and I hit record um, on my dictation app on my phone. Greg, I was not ready for what I heard. I can't remember what the first question was that I asked him, but I just had a list of questions and started saying, okay, so what was it like? What were you feeling? And one of the first things I remember him responding to that was difficult was how he felt upon the initial diagnosis and what that was like for him emotionally. Now, my husband is an engineer. Sure. He's a solid person. He doesn't show a lot of emotion. I and can't even imagine Tolan showing an ounce of emotion, so I'm interested to hear this. So he, he really didn't let people see it. I can remember one time where I knew he was experiencing some emotion and it was, it was so early on in our journey. I hadn't had my surgeries. We were still trying to figure out what to do. We didn't have a surgeon who would be willing to operate. And really at that point in time, the doctors had said, we don't think there's anything we can do for you. And we were in the car together and I remember I was closing my eyes because at that time I had vertigo and dizzy spells all the time. And so it may have looked as though I were asleep Yep. because my eyes were closed and I was leaning back in the chair. And all of a sudden I heard something like sniffling. Sure. And I opened my eyes and looked over and Tolan um, had some tears not dripping down his face, but just welling up yep. in his eyes. And... I said, what are you thinking? And he said, I'm wondering what it was like when my grandfather had to go home from the hospital and tell his kids that their mother had died. Dang. Because his grandfather had lost his wife when she was exactly the age. age that wow. I was when I was diagnosed. And she had breast cancer. And she had gone into the hospital and 
her kids did not realize how sick she was. It was kind of at a time where they didn't talk about it as openly. And he had to go home and break the news to their kids. So he was scared. He, he was scared. scared. He was scared. And what I didn't realize until that interview years later was that even though he didn't express it to me or really to anyone else, he had to go through that whole range of what ifs. Yeah. What if this doesn't turn out the way that we want? What if Jody doesn't survive? Then what? Yeah. Then he would be a single dad yep. raising four kids without a mom around. And then everything really would be on his plate. Um, well, not only just not a mom, but not, you know, you're his wife. I mean, he loves you. And the going through those emotions, he said, was something he had to experience in order to be able to move forward. Because yeah. he didn't know what was going to happen, but he felt as if if he'd gone through it mentally and gone to the worst places possible, that then no matter what else happened, that he would be able to handle it a little bit better because he will have gone through it already and he will have tried to work something out through that Got situation. It. And so he, he had spent quite a bit of alone time thinking about what happens if Jody doesn't make it? What is that gonna mean for me? What is that gonna mean for our family? What is that gonna mean for our kids? How would we do that? I'm curious, what was your response? When he, when he shared that with you, what did you say back? I, I was a little taken back. I, I didn't realize the depth of emotion that he had for it because his goal was always to be so solid for me. Yeah. I didn't ever see that. Yeah. And so when he talked about the possibility of losing me and I said, well, would you get remarried? Well, what would you do? Yeah. He's like, I can't imagine that I could get remarried. He's like, I don't, I'm a one woman person. Yeah. I'm a one woman man. I can't imagine ever wanting to, being with anyone else, being attracted to anyone else in that way. I just think I would stay alone. Yeah. And, and he said, so then I'm thinking about, you know, do I get a nanny for my children? Do I change my job? Do I change where, you know, so he was just going through all of these different emotions. Um, and then also once we got to the point where I was in the hospital and going into surgery, he had those long, long hours of waiting to find out. Yeah. You know, I went to sleep and woke up. Yeah. <laughs> and it was pretty quick from my perspective. You know, his perspective, every minute those are was long just waits. long days. And my surgery was supposed to be five to six hours, and it ended up being more like 11 wow. hours. And so as the day so just 11 hours stretched just... on and on, you can imagine the anticipation and the anxiety that just built and built and built. Question for you. So is there anything you wish you could have said to him to help him, like looking back, like something where you go, man, if, if I had the energy or the, the strength at that moment, I wish I could have told him this. Mm, that's, I think the thing I would have wanted him to know more than anything was simply that I wasn't giving up. That even though I may not have been 100% or I was certainly I was far from 100%. I was very weak. I wasn't giving up. I wasn't giving up on him. I wasn't giving up on our family because even though at times it got so difficult and I wasn't able to do very much, I was still there. I was still invested. And, and at one point in time, realizing, you know, I may not make it, but if I don't make it, it's not because I'm giving up on you. It's not because I don't love you. It's not because I'm not fighting to be here with you. If it doesn't go the way we want, it's because it's not within my control. But if it's in my control, I'm going to stay and I'm going to fight for you. And those were thoughts I had in my head. But at the time, I was so sick. I was so in survival mode, I couldn't say those things. After I did survive and after I did get home, um, I think the conversation would have changed. It would have been more along the lines of, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought to build myself back up. And this is going to be a bigger, longer journey. Um, and we're both going to have to be super patient with each other because I just don't think I had a for clue sure. Sure. of what we were in for. And, and, and the fact that it changed my personality. 
not just the get her done, conquer the world aspect of me because I was so physically weakened, but for the first time in my life, I felt vulnerable. I realized I wasn't invincible. Yeah. Right? You go through your young life feeling like nothing is going to get you down. You can break through glass. You can hit the wall yeah. and bounce off and you're going to be okay. And for the first time, I realized that was not the case. And How old were you at this time, by the way? 33 years 33. old. 33. Yeah. 33 years wow. old and had been that, you know, get her done girl my whole life. And, and all of a sudden, I became nervous and anxious. I had anxiety for the yeah. first time. I can honestly <laughs> tell you until that point in time, I don't think I knew what a panic attack was. I don't think I knew what real anxiety sure. was like. I, when I would hear people talk about it, I thought, so you're nervous about something? Yeah. Like, like, what does that you just mean? Couldn't, you couldn't understand it because you, you've never gone through that level. I hadn't experienced that depth of things. And then all of a sudden I started having great emotional and mental distress over even little things. Being in the car and not not having control and we're on the freeway and my mind is going to places like, oh my gosh, if we get in a wreck, I'm gonna be back in that ICU, my head is gonna be wrapped up, I'm gonna be right back to where I started. And that was something I had never experienced. Wow, that's, whoa. And that's gotta be challenging because it's your you're at your most vulnerable state. I was at my most vulnerable and it was having major impact on my husband. And he's realizing this is not the same person that yeah. he married. Yeah. That the, the invincible, independent, yep. stubborn, type A girl <laughs> that I was, was suddenly gone, at least temporary, temporarily. And he didn't know if it was temporary or if it was long-term. Got it. And I, I think to hear him talk about the fact that I became a different person and that it was not the Jody that he married, Oh, I mean, talk about, you know, hitting you in the gut. Wow. That, what was your emotion on that? I mean, did you cry? Did you, oh. did you, <laughs> were you upset? Did you? D, all of the above. I cried. I was upset. There was part of me that was even mad. And I, how could I have been mad? I was the one that changed. Sure. It was, I was the one that went through the things that caused it. And yet to hear him express it, ooh, it was just heart-wrenching. And so there was part of me, I was shocked to hear this and it had been years. And so there was part of me that was maybe upset that I didn't know these experiences sure. earlier, that I was finding this out only because I went and asked these specific questions. Like, why didn't you tell me this before? That he hadn't let me in on it. But then he was like, well, you were doing everything you could to survive. And it was hard enough for you. I wasn't gonna add that to your plate. <laughs> And what did that do to me? That made me feel like, wow, people thought I had the hard job. Yeah. People thought that my job is just trying to rebuild and be the survivor was the difficult thing. And what I realized was he had the hardest job of all. Yeah. Because he wasn't just being the caregiver. He was also dealing with this total change in my personality and in what that meant for our marriage. That it wasn't going to be, at least for a while, it wasn't going to be able to be that we're both in this 100%, we're 50-50 partners. It was going to have to have that increase, and that was going to be different than what it had been before because I wouldn't be able to give the kinds of things I had been before. Here's a question that I'm curious. How did it, like, so as you're very injured, were you able to, were you afraid to give him a kiss or hold his hand or even, like, move because your body can't, like, do those things yeah. the same way. Or you're, or even if it can, it you're afraid you're that afraid. something might break or something, something might go wrong. Well, I'll tell you, with the facial paralysis, um, what you see now is very different than what it was because it has changed over time, and now we're, we're going through a process to try and restore some of the functionality that I had lost, which is another topic yeah, we should absolutely, absolutely talk about. Um, but in the beginning, I had I had no movement at all on the whole side of my face, and so I couldn't physically kiss my husband, and that was a little bit of a another gut punch. Um, and I remember when he tried to kiss me, and I had to say, "Okay, 
like this is not this does not work and it was so uncomfortable uncomfortable for me to realize it wasn't working that i was just okay don't can't go there yeah and and that's a that's a painful that's a painful place to be and to realize that it was me that was pulling yeah. back yeah that he still loved me and wanted to have that intimacy between us and that i was the one who had to say i can't, I can't do, do that um and so that I think was on another level. And then, then, and there were times where he wanted to be physically close to me yeah. and put his arm around me and cuddle with me. And, and you can't. I, I physically was so weakened, it was just difficult. And so. Um, and here's a question. So, with that being said, you know, in a marriage, right, that you need that touch, the connection. Did that. Did you sometimes feel lonely because you couldn't connect in that way? Like, was there you ever know, any times I of that? As I think about it now, I would guess that he was probably the one who had those feelings of being lonely because we couldn't connect in that way as much. Um, I really still felt like I was in my cocoon. I was just looking out for myself. I was trying Absolutely. to survive. I was trying to... And of course, I wanted to be able to be there for my husband, um, but it was on such a limited basis of what I was able to give that, you know, I felt like I was trying. I felt like I wanted to be there with him. And when we had times to be intimate, I tried very hard to be there and to make yep. that work. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like it had yeah. been. And um, I think our intimacy became more of like sitting on the couch next sure. to each other, sitting on the bed next to each other, maybe watching a movie together. Um, as opposed to really spending the kind of time that we were used to and would have wanted to spend together, we just couldn't. And in hindsight, I'm sure that that was much more difficult for him to be back home where sure. things should have been more normal, yep. and they clearly were not. And it was probably entree in his mind into realizing, oh, wow, this is a whole new relationship. Yep, this, is the whole... this is not the person I married, this is not the experience we had. This is not the marriage we had. And so to do that interview and to hear those things come out of his mouth oh. and to hear him say, this was not the person that I married. Mm. Gosh, Tough. that's that's got to be... Tough. Oh, well, you know what? On the next video, I actually want to go in depth on... Um, how you dealt with kind of that those emo that i guess the range of maybe we'll call it what it is negative emotions right yeah. um and and how you best dealt with that and and how you coped with it and kind of your journey through it so in, in our next video i want to go over that and and really share some some cool stuff that may be helpful but some insight on the realities of what happens when you know life changes and so make sure to take Take a look at that next video.